Morning everybody, great to see you all again. So, how well do you know your camera? So when I say understand your camera, it isn't so much about understanding the settings on your camera and how to use your camera, but how your camera performs when it's out in the field. I think that's one of the most important things you can do to get better at photography. So maybe that might be understanding how it performs in low light at higher ISO, how it performs at different ends of the scale of the aperture range. So maybe well, how does it perform at, at really wide open at f2 or how does it perform at f20 when diffraction starts to set in. But when you start to understand those things and you get a better appreciation of how your camera operates, then you start to take much better photos. And also, when the light changes and you've got to time it just right, you won't be messing about or trying different things. You'll just know, I need to set this on F10, I need the ISO 200, I want the shutter speed to be one sixtieth of a second, and you're gonna get some amazing shots. Okay, so. We're gonna, I've taken some test shots, we're gonna go back to the studio and I'll talk to you all about four ways that you can significantly improve your photography by understanding your lens and camera setup. Come on, Pebbles. Okay, so I'm back in my studio now. It's a studio, by the way. Lots of people comment below saying it's not a studio. They say, it's a studio, it's just your office. Well, I call it my studio, so it's my studio. I'll show you around later anyway. So it's really interesting that I've done quite a lot of workshops recently and on those workshops, one of the things that people ask me is how do you focus your camera? What ISO do you use? Or where do you focus your, your camera? And I think it's something that I've learned to be intuitive about. So I know, you know what ISO will work on this camera, where I need to focus to get everything in focus. And um, I understand what aperture I can use on this lens to get the sharpest shot if, if I've got a bit of a choice of apertures. And I just understand this camera and this lens really well. So if you get a microwave, I think everyone's got a microwave. When that breaks, you go and get a new microwave and you go and get your milk and you put it in the microwave. Do you heat milk up? Yeah, you heat your milk up in the microwave. I have hot milk on, on, my, on my breakfast. Bit odd, but there we go. Put it in the microwave and suddenly it's bubbling because I put it on for a minute and it's more powerful than microwave. It takes me a little bit to work out how long I have to heat that milk up in the microwave, in this new microwave, to get it just right. And I have to understand the workings of that microwave. And it's no different with the camera and the lens. You know, if you get a new lens for your camera or if you get a new camera, you need to understand the ISO performance of the sensor. You need to understand the aperture performance and um, how the lens works at f22 or f2 and it's no good just looking online and seeing what, what other people have said you've got to understand it for yourself and if you do start to understand it for yourself and do some tests and I'll tell you about the tests later on in the video they're really simple then you will get much better photos and you'll significantly improve your photography. And the reason you'll do that is because you're not gonna be thinking so much about what aperture to put it on or where to focus. You're gonna be concentrating on when the light's good, you're gonna know exactly what to do and you're gonna get a great shot and get that timing just right. So there are four things that you need to be able to answer. There's four questions really that you need to be able to answer about your camera. So let's have a look at them. Okay, so the first thing that you need to be able to answer is what ISO you should use on your camera. And what I mean by that is not what ISO is right for the scene, but what ISO can your camera go to and still maintain a good level of quality. What that can do is sometimes bring noise into the image. Um, it can also change slightly the dynamic range of the image and um, reduce the saturation of colours in the image when you go up to higher ISOs. But it's very different for, di for different cameras. So I know that I can go to a higher ISO on my Nikon D810, slightly higher, than I can with my Fuji X-T2. 
but how high can I go? When do I start to notice that difference? If I know that, then I, I, I then need to not worry too much about changing that ISO, and it can be just one part of that exposure triangle to be able to control the shutter speed to get the best shot. And you might say, well, why do I want to increase the ISO if I've got it on a tripod? I just want to have it on the lowest ISO as possible and you know get the best possible quality. But it's not necessarily true, because sometimes you might set it up, you might think, okay, I've got to have it at f8, um, but it's quite dark, there's a little bit of wind blowing, and you're shooting some trees, and you don't want those leaves to be too blurred. So you want a shutter speed of maybe one, say, 30th of a second, but you can't do that on ISO 100. You've got to go up to ISO 800 to get that shutter speed. But do you know in your camera, if you can go to ISO 800, what happens if you have to go up to ISO 1600? Is that still an acceptable image that you're gonna be happy with, you're gonna be able to print to a large enough size and not see any noise or degradation in the image quality. Another example is Iceland. When I was in Iceland, we were shooting the Aurora. Obviously it was dark, my Nikon had failed. I had to shoot with my Fuji. So I needed to be able to work out what ISO I could shoot up to. Now luckily I'd done some tests and I knew that I could go up to 3200 and I'd lose a little bit of quality but it would still be okay and that allowed me to shoot the Aurora with my Fuji X-T2. So the second thing is aperture and, and when you're moving the aperture, so usually on landscapes you might want to shoot a, a smaller aperture, a higher number, F number. Um, what can you go up to before you start to get some diffraction and um, degradation of the image quality? So as you reduce the size of the aperture on your lens, then you get diffraction effects from the light going through that really small aperture and interfering. And that can cause soft images and it's different again for different lenses and different cameras, different sensor sizes. So you've got to be able to understand again, what, what your camera is capable of. So you want to be able to do some tests before you, you critically need this to know what you can go up to. Is it possible to go up to f22 or do you just want to steer clear for, for, of that? Never go to f22. Before you go to f22, just um, focus, stack the image. So the third thing, and probably the thing I get asked most often when I'm on workshops, and certainly I get asked a lot in the comments below as well, which is where do you focus? So. People always ask me where I focus in the image to get a sharp image throughout the image because obviously shooting landscapes quite often, more often than not, you're shooting with a wide angle and you want it pin sharp from right there in the foreground to the background mountains. Um, so it's really easy to be honest and, and I don't often focus stack the image. What I do is understand the lenses that I have. So whether that's the wide angle, I think it's the 10 to 24 lens on my Fuji or the 16 to 35 F4 lens that I use for my wide angle lens on my Nikon 8, 810. I know pretty well where to focus and I, well, I know where to focus, but I also know what is gonna be in focus on, on, based on what f-stop because I've done the tests and I can work that out. So when you're doing a depth of field test to work out what's going to be in focus, the best thing to do is have maybe a path with um, lines on it that you can measure really easily. Or in this case, I, there's, there's a walk um, way that's wooden slats on it. Um, it's really got really good detail on it that I can check really easily afterwards in Lightroom whether it's in focus. And then basically I just use an arm's length and work out on arm's lengths how far away the rock can be from my lens to, to make sure it's in focus. I focus on infinity all the time. I say infinity, the furthest mountain. And then I make sure that um, I've got it on the f-stop that will allow me to get from that furthest mountain all the way to the, the closest subject in my, in my frame. We can have a look later and we can see the impact uh, a changing aperture has on the depth of field on this really wide angle lens. The final thing, what shutter speed can you hand hold? So no longer the day where it's just one over the focal length of, of your lens, because obviously um, you've got electronic image stabilization in body now, the Sonys are amazing at that. Um, obviously there's the new Fuji X-H1 that's got in-body stabilization just come out as well. But then you've also got lens stabilization. And if you have one or both of those on, what shutter speed can you take an image to make sure that it's sharp when it's handheld? 
More and more now, I use my X-T2 and I'm hand holding the shot to take a landscape. And I know that if I go below a certain shutter speed, then it, th th I'm not gonna be able to hand hold it. I've got to put it on, on a tripod. And I also know that if it's like 1 30th of a second for argument's sake, then I know I can nail that every time and get it pin sharp. Okay. Let's go and have a look at the shots I took in Lightroom and I'll talk to you a little bit more about how I would compare those images and choose the ranges of what are acceptable for ISO, aperture and hand holding your camera. Okay, so let's look at ISO before. This was a reasonably well lit scene. It was cloudy and I'm in a woodland so it wasn't super well lit but so this one here is at ISO 200 this image on the left hand side. And then all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna compare it. So I put X, Y here. So now I've got those two there. What I want to do is just zoom in. So this one on the left is at ISO 100 and the one on the right is at ISO 400. So as I go up in ISO, you can see on the right hand side here, the difference it makes. So at ISO 400, there really isn't much different. If I just scroll around, you can see the colors and the green leaves are pretty good. There's lots of saturation down there on both of them. Yeah, it's the, 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 they're pretty good really. I, I don't really see a big difference. Now, if I go up to 800, ISO 800, again, I can't really see a difference there. Now you could go up to 200% and really look closely at it. And I've not sharpened or done anything with these images. These are just raw images with and nothing done with them. If I do anything in Lightroom, I'll get about a thousand comments about why I shouldn't have processed my Fuji images in Lightroom. Okay, so I don't think there's a huge difference there. I'm gonna go back out to 100%. I'll go back in and go to the next one. And the next one is the ISO 1000. So again, I can't see a huge difference. Let me go to 200%. I think I'm starting to see a bit. You can see the contrast here. Local contrast is slightly worse in this area. So I'd be happy with that. So if I could, I think I could shoot up to ISO 1000 and be super happy with it. So now let's go up to ISO 1250. I think I'd still be happy with that, to be honest. So ISO 1600. Yeah, so you can see now that I'm starting to get a, quite a bit of reduction in detail. And once you get up to ISO 12,800, then obviously the image drops off significantly. And you can see now as well that the color is significantly reduced at that. So I would definitely not want to shoot at that ISO. So I think from that, I'm happy shooting from ISO 200, obviously, right the way up to, I think, ISO 1600 if need be, but definitely up to ISO 1000, and I shouldn't worry about that at all. So the next thing to look at is the aperture of the lens. So it's fairly well known on a wide angle lens that, it, it, that like a 10 to 24 on the, on the Fuji, that it's probably gonna operate a little bit better at the 10 millimeter end than it is at 24 millimeter end. So I've looked at it at both ends basically to see if there's any difference. So let's have a look at the 10 millimeter first. So this one is F5 and this one is F7. There's not a huge amount of difference there. Um, in the center, if I go down to the bottom, so I put a, a, the camera in a position that means that whatever aperture I'm on, the whole scene's gonna be in focus. I haven't got anything really close to me, basically. So if I go to the bottom of the frame here, then they're fairly similar. Again, go back into the middle. You, you need to go around and look at the whole frame when, when you do this yourself, but yep, they're, they're, they're fairly similar. So F5 and F7 look, look fairly similar. So when I go to F11, then, I am starting to see some softness in the image and I probably need to be careful around the F11 and anything above that because I'm starting to get a little bit of softness. But obviously if that's gonna get the whole scene in, 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 um, in focus, then that, that makes sense to be able to go to that. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably happy we're going to F11. Now the next one is F16. So let's have a look at F16. Probably just need to zoom in a little bit. So I'm gonna zoom in yeah, and you can see, I mean, there's a significant difference at F16. We've now started to get a, a very soft image um, where the diffraction effects are taking place. So I've got to be really careful um, at F16. So the, the other thing I wanted to show you is depth of field. So once you've worked out what's the smallest aperture that you can go to, using that aperture, 
where do you need to focus to get um, depth of field throughout the image? So let's just take, start with an F5. So I went, I, I found this path here and I focused on um, the trees in the background here. I always focus on the furthest thing in the subject. There's a lot of people talk about the hyperfocal distance. I don't bother with that. I, I find that focusing on the furthest thing in the subject and then get as much depth of field as I can with that particular lens gets me the best results. So uh, let's have a look at the depth of field. And this is at 10 millimeters. And you'll be surprised at 10 millimeters, you don't have to go to a really small aperture to get quite a lot in focus. So I, was pointing my camera down and I knew the distance of all these posts and I just recorded them as well. So I've just got that in place. And I did it in strides and arm lengths so that I, I can quite easily and fairly roughly, but reasonably accurately do this when I'm in the field without having to get a tape measure out or anything like that. So the one on the left here is F5.6 and the one on the right here is f6.4. So I'm just gonna, again, um, zoom in. So we'll zoom into 100%. So this is, the, this is the one that, as you can see, as I go down here, you can see that neither of these are in focus right down at the bottom here. So it's not enough depth of field, but once I get up to about the one, two, go up to 200, probably the fourth rung, then the F5 6.4 is in focus there. Probably actually the third one it's in focus. So F8, zooming again to 200%, you can see that it's now sharp. So that's sharp all the way through the image at F8. So I can get something at arm's length in front of my camera all the way to the distance in focus F8 at 10 millimeters. And I'll do the same for different focal lengths and work that out and write that down in my photo book um, or on my phone. So I hope that's been helpful. I think it's really important that you go and if you, if you don't already know these things, and I'm sure most of you probably will, but go and, 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 and make sure you understand your camera and how it interacts with light and how you can push it or not push it um, depending on the circumstances. I think you'll find a definite improvement in your photography. Before I go, I just want to say thanks. Um, I put these prints up um, as a special thanks for 25,000 subscribers on my, on my website. I don't think I actually mentioned it in my video, so I want to mention it now because there's still some left. I um, did a limited number of 50. Uh, I've sold 38 of them, so there's 12 left. All you have to do is head over to the link here um, and they are at half price. So for an A3 print, and you can only get an A3 print, and there's this image and there's two other images and they are some of my favorites from Iceland. The, like I said, there's a limited um, edition of 50. Yeah, so head, head over to my site if you're interested in one of those and I really appreciate it. It makes a big difference to me to be able to do this channel. And the other thing is I've got some workshops going on as well. So there's two or three workshops that have still got some places, not many. One is in Cornwall in the south uh, of England, um, which, which, which is just a fantastic location. Uh, there's one in the Peak District, and I've got up and coming a Faroe Islands workshop. So there's a waiting list for, for that. I put it out in my email newsletter, so those people are now on the waiting list. If anybody else is interested in getting on that waiting list, then just drop me an email, I'll stick you on, and I'll send you the details first when they, when they come out which should be in a week or two. Good, okay, well thanks ever so much for watching again. If you've liked this content, please give it a thumbs up and comment below. And also make sure you've pressed the bell icon so that when I publish new videos, you, you, you get a notification. Great, thanks ever so much for watching. Until next Sunday, bye. Okay, a quick tour around my massive studio. So first of all, down here, this is where I sit, so I'll just this is where I sit. I usually sit about here. I don't know where the chair's gone. That's a light, microphone. If I go around here, you can probably see it a little bit better. So there's a boom road microphone down there. This here is for when I shoot down onto my prints. There's a light. That's my camera. My laptop. 
my shelves, my printers just there next to me. And if I just sort of move around here, then I've got a sort of print station that I sign and check all my prints. So here's some that are going to be going out. And there's another printer station over there. Massive studio. Okay, see you next week, guys. Mm -hmm.